Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to pry open our hearts and minds so we can receive what you have to give to us today. <clears throat> These scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said, help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So many of you know that I'm just coming off of 10 days of isolation <clears throat> for COVID. Didn't leave my house for 10 days. Wore a mask whenever I climbed out of my basement to be in contact with my wife, Cindy. <clears throat> Wore gloves around the kitchen. But I couldn't touch the plates and the glasses. It's kind of fun. <clears throat> Took my temperature regularly, checked my oxygen levels all, often. And I want to thank those that sent me texts and cards and brought food by the house. Appreciate all those who sent out their prayers. I felt them, but I really didn't get that sick. I tell folks I got better, I didn't get worse. <clears throat> kind of had a sinus infection kind of thing, but never ran a temperature. Um, I've been vaccinated three times. Took the infusion kind of thing. My wife says I have more antibodies than you can possibly think of because I got all the synthetic ones, I got all the biological ones. Um, but I got to admit, when I got that text notice, 15 minutes, from my testing with the health department, I had to stop my car. And I shed a few tears right there. All this time, I've been able to avoid catching it. I'd been careful, double masking everywhere, outside, inside, around crowds. But those tears were about that question. When you find out you got it, you ask yourself, is this it? Is this going to get me? Even though in my mind I knew I had all those vaccinations and just got my booster shot, emotionally I still wondered, is this it? Every day we learn about another disaster, another tragedy, another mass shooting, another eight kids trampled to death in an outdoor concert in Houston. It is never ending. Every day. So I'm going to start out today by letting you turn to your neighbor and tell them what it is that's wrong with our world right now. Things that make yourself make you ask yourself, is this it? Is it? Is this the end? So turn to your neighbor. I give you permission to speak out loud to the people next to you. Tell them what it is that makes you ask that question. I'll give you 20 seconds. Go. <clears throat> So what'd you come up with? With masks on, I can't tell if you're talking to each other or not. <clears throat> what'd you come up with? The way, we treat each other the way we treat each other as people right now? Kind of frightening. Greed. Greed. Anybody say the word inflation? That's hot right now. Focusing on differences instead of what's the same. Steve, did you talk to your wife? Did she talk to you? <laughs> you listen. 
I've known that about you two for a very long time. <clears throat> Similar to my wife and myself. I'm a good listener. <clears throat> Anybody else? Political craziness. I did this same exercise I got to thinking at Seward after the school bus crash. I don't know if you remember. Bus flipped over on its way home from Omaha. Four people died, three kids, one parent. We had four community-wide funerals. And the first Sunday after that, we did the same thing. Turn to your neighbor and talk about the darkness. What's going on? Right now, I think the number is at 750,000 people have died from COVID in our country. Uh, anybody know the world one? Google it really fast. It's a race. Confirmation's never been the same since Google. <laughs> I think we're in the millions, aren't we? So my question to you is, do you think this is what God wants things to be like? Is this the way God wants things to be? Five point one million in the world. So if this is not the way we think God wants it to be, what do you think God has in mind? A place where we all get along? A place where children are not starving every day? A place where everyone has a purpose and did fulfilling work? Got a living wage? A place where relationships were more important than money? A place where human life is more important than money? A place where justice and equal treatment are the most important things? I was just wondering. At the early service, we sang things out of the hymnal. And we sang all African-American spiritual songs that were written at a time when, as a slave in America, you had no hope. And you guys in seminary will tell us apocalyptic writings about the end of time happen when people have no hope. So African Americans, their hope was in the old world dying and the new world of God coming into place. Because otherwise, the reality that they were living in, they had no hope. You might remember an old skit by Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks called The 2,000-Year-Old Man. You have to be as, at least as old as me. So all you young whippersnappers never saw that. You don't even know who Carl Reiner is. <clears throat> Reiner plays a TV reporter. Mel Brooks plays a 2,000-year-old man. So the newsman says, well, did you worship God in your village? And the old man says, no, at first we worship this guy in our village named Phil. And the newsman says, you worshiped a guy named Phil, why? And the old man says, well, he was bigger than everybody else and faster and he was mean and he could hurt you and he'd break your arm or your leg in two. So we worshiped Phil. And the newsman said, I see, did you have any prayers in this religion, the religion of Phil? And the old man said, yeah, you want to hear one? Please, Phil, no. Please, no, Phil. And the newsman says, okay, when did you stop worshiping Phil? And the old man says, well, one day we were having a religious festival. Phil was chasing us. And we were praying, please, Phil, no. No, Phil, please. And suddenly a thunderstorm came up. A bolt of lightning struck and killed Phil. We all gathered around him lying on the ground there and stared at him for a while. And we realized... 
there's something bigger than Phil. Something bigger. That is the ultimate message of apocalyptic literature. There's something bigger than Phil. There's something bigger than the bad stuff that happens in our lives. And that something bigger is God. That something bigger is faith in God's tomorrow overcoming yesterday's and today's. That something bigger is the faith that God is indeed very much in the game. God is involved in our pain and our sorrow and our suffering and disappointment. And God is bigger, much bigger than those things that frighten haunt us where we are. God is bigger than a COVID diagnosis. Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite Christian writers, says, I think that it's possible to say that in spite of all of its extraordinary variety, the Bible is held together by a single plot. It's one that can be simply stated. God creates the world. The world gets lost. God seeks to restore the world to the glory in which God created it. I'd say we're lost right now. Wouldn't you? We're not living like God created us to live. And what it's going to, what is it going to take to get us back on the right path? The Markin scholar, biblical scholar Lamar Williamson, reminds us that every gospel writer leaves the church with a challenge. The Gospel of John calls the church to love one another. Matthew and Luke call the church to engage in mission to the Gentiles, to those who are other. These are daunting challenges, but he says maybe the most daunting challenges for Christians in the North American context is the one left by Mark. Mark says, beware, keep awake, resist, resist and hold on for the coming of the Son of Man. Will Willimon Bishop retired, talks about how a high school commencement speaker would stand at the podium and his address urged the graduates to have a dream, to follow their dream. Let no one deter you from your life's dream. And he said, that kind of talk is fine, but it's not particularly Christian. Christians, he says, are people attempting to live out God's dream. To live their lives in such a way that God may get what God wants. Jesus said to his disciples then, and I think to us now, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. I don't think we can properly deal with the writing like Mark 13 without dealing with the subject of false teachers. It's a popular misconception that's been spread in recent times about the end of life on earth as we know it. It's called the rapture. Have you heard that term? Marcus Borg, biblical scholar, theologian, points out in his book, Speaking Christian, he says, most Christians throughout history never heard of the rapture. And with good reason, the word, the notion it embodies are modern innovations going back less than two centuries. Nobody even thought of the rapture until the 1800s. Because millions of Christians think that the rapture is biblical teaching, thus has the authority of the Bible behind it, he says it's important to know that it is neither biblical nor ancient. But Bork says it was first proclaimed by a British evangelist named John Nelson Darby in the first half of the 19th century. Darby concocted his vision of the rapture by his interpretation of a few passages from the Bible that speak about the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world. And according to Darby's imaginative scenario, the rapture begins a series of events that unfold seven years before the second coming of Jesus and the final judgment. More specifically, it refers to an event when true Christians, as he would term them, would be raptured or taken up to heaven before Jesus' coming. Who are, those who are raptured will be spared the tribulation, the horrific suffering, the wars, the devastation that face those who are left behind. Sound familiar? 
As you probably guessed, The Rapture is the premise of a series of novels titled Left Behind by Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins. These novels have sold nearly 60 million copies since they were published in the mid-1990s. And these books have made their authors very wealthy. All 12 in the original series have been on the New York Times best-selling fiction list. Before Left Behind series, there was the late Great Planet Earth, best-selling book by Hal Lindsey, which came out when I was in college. I went and heard Hal Lindsey speak in Lincoln at the downtown auditorium. He has pretty much the same scenario. These books and the movies that have been based on them have had a disturbing influence on a lot of Christians. For one thing, they've convinced as many as 40% of American Christians that the second coming will happen quite soon. And they've stirred up much fear among impressionable readers. Those who espouse such concerns seem to confuse fear with faith. Arousing fear in people, says Borg, can be both quite easy and quite profitable, as many cable news channels have learned. Jesus says to the disciples then and to us now, do not be deceived by those who claim to speak for me. There's the classic Peanuts cartoon. Linus and Lucy are standing at the window watching it rain and it's just pouring down and Lucy says to Linus, look at it rain, what if the whole earth, earth floods? And Linus says it won't. God promised Noah in Genesis chapter 9 he would never flood the world ever again and the sign of his promise is the rainbow. And Lucy smiles and says, Linus, you've taken a great load off of my mind. To which Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. Jesus makes it very clear, regardless of what certain popular books and movies infer, it might be thousands or millions of years before the end comes. Nobody knows, neither scientists or theologians or quack preachers on the radio or TV. Borg says, here's what I want you to remember. Life is unpredictable. Terrible things will always happen in this world. And I don't say that to you so that you will be afraid. Exactly the opposite is true. I want you to know that regardless of what comes, God will never leave you or forsake you. Even if the entire world should pass away, God will still be with you. It said the old story about Ben-Hur. Do you remember this one? Charlton Heston in that movie was told he needed to learn how to drive a chariot, four-horse chariot around that circle. It was part of the race, probably the most exciting filming that had ever happened at that time. And he trained for many weeks with chariot lessons. Charleston chariots. He says, I think I can drive the chariot all right, but I'm not sure I can actually win the race to his director. And the director said, you just stay in the race. I'll make sure you win in the movie. Maybe that's the Christian message to us in a troubled time. You just stay in the race. God says, I'll make sure you win. Don't let false teachers fill your minds with needless anxiety. Nobody knows what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. God holds the future, and we are God's own children. Do not be afraid. Mike Iaconelli, a wonderful pastor and writer, wrote a column in The Door. It speaks of hope and getting lost and finding our way again. He speaks of life as a frightening yet also promising time of dying and rising. He says, so here I stand looking at the ground, smelling the faint fragrance of God. Never once did it occur to me that when I found God's trail again, it would ruin my life forever. For once you feel the breath of God on your skin, you can never turn back. You can never settle for what was. You can only move on recklessly with abandon, your heart filled with fear, your ears ringing with that constant whisper, fear not. Once you find where the trail is, you're faced with the sobering truth that in order to go on, you must let go of what brought you there. You can't go on without turning your back on what brought you to this place. He says it's like the swinging trapeze. 
once you've gained the courage to swing, you never want to let go. And then without warning, it happened at about age 50 for me, you look up and you see the other trapeze swinging toward you, perfectly timed to meet you, and you realize you're going to be asked to let go and grab onto another trapeze. You have to release your grip. You have to reach out. You have to experience the glorious terror of in-betweenness as you disconnect from one and reach for the other. Mike Iaconelli says this past year has been a time of letting go for him, one finger at a time. These last few weeks, he says, a terrifying weightlessness, a weightlessness, a paralyzing stretch for the unknown. He says, I haven't reached the other bar yet, but I'm somewhere in between. But I can tell you this, my heart is filled with exhilaration and anxious anticipation that just as I let the other bar go, I will not grasp it, but I will instead be grasped by the hand of Jesus. I can hardly wait. Are you floating in that in-between right now between one trapeze and the other? Retired Bishop Will Willeman once again says, sometimes things can't be made new until the old is destroyed. Sometimes there can't be a birth until there's a death. He says, remembers being told as a young pastor that churches rarely grow and become renewed without pain. He says, I was at a congregation and had many problems, and I called a church consultant to advise me in my leadership, and he studied our situation and then said to me, for there to be a new church here, you've got to kill the old church. Something old must die in order for something new to be born. And Will said that sounded a little too radical to me. I couldn't bring myself to say that to the congregation, so we continued to live much as we had done before, and no real renewal came. We were too enamored with the temple that we had to think of relinquishing it for the temple God might be trying to offer us. Has anybody here had to die in order to live? So does someone here know what it's like to have your temple destroyed only to be replaced by something much better? Has your very bad news ever become good news? My witness to folks lately as I've been doing drumming circles is that my drumming circle thing came to be because I almost died in a car wreck. And you've heard me tell that story before. I wasn't sure if I'd ever walk again. But when I did come back, I heard God saying to me, do the fun stuff more. Before then, there were no drumming circles. After that, God and I decided we'd do more of the fun stuff. Now I have this ministry of joy. About 10 different places in Grand Island and Hastings where we go and the activity directors love us because we get their heart rate up and it's music therapy all at the same time. But it wouldn't have happened. I think if I hadn't almost died in that car wreck, has your very bad news ever become good news? Years ago, Fred Craddock, professor of preaching in Candor School of Theology in Atlanta, I think I've told this story before, how they were on vacation with his wife in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It was the last day of vacation. They stopped at their favorite little cafe called the Blackberry Inn. They didn't want to be bothered. And this old country guy came in and just started talking to everybody. You know that type. Fred thought, as he cursed behind his menu, don't come to our table. Don't talk to us. Sure enough, the guy came to Fred's table, pulled up a chair, said, you folks on vacation? Fred looked down and said, yes. Having a good time? Fred said, I thought to myself, I was. Going to be here long? Nope, not at all. What do you do? It's the question Fred had been waiting for because he couldn't shut people down with his answer. He said, well, I'm a professor of homiletics and theology in Atlanta. And the old man lit up and said, you're a preacher, man? Well, I got a preacher story for you. So he scooted his chair up, took a sip of Fred's water, 
said, I was born back in these mountains. My mama was not married. We lived in a shack outside of town. I ate my lunch alone. They said I wasn't any good and I never amount to anything. Kids used to call me Ben the Bastard Boy. Ben the Bastard Boy. He said, I thought Bastard Boy was my last name. The old man was weeping now, and he collected himself. So well, anyway, there was this church in Laurel Springs that had this preacher. His voice was big like God's voice. And I knew the church wasn't a place for boys like me. We know a church, they wouldn't call him Bastard Boy. They'd find other ways to say the same thing. He said, sometimes I'd go in and sit at the back so I could sneak out before the service ended. But this one day, I just got lost in what the preacher was saying. And before I knew it, church was over. The aisles got all jammed up and folks were looking at me. I was making for the back door as quick as I could when all at once I felt a big hand on my shoulder. And the big voice boomed. Boy. He said, boy, and I froze. And he talked so loud, everybody heard what he said. He said, boy, who's your daddy? Boy, I know who your daddy is. He said, that was a knife in my gut. I wondered, did he know who my daddy was? He said, boy, now let's see. He looked at my face and he says, why, you are a child of, and he paused and everybody listened and leaned in and he said, boy, look at you, you're a child of God and I can see a striking re resemblance. And he swatted me on the bottom and said, now you run, run along and go claim your inheritance. And the old man looked at Fred, and Fred looked at him, and he said, something was familiar. Fred said, what's your name, sir? And the old guy said, Ben, Ben Hooper. Fred said, Ben Hooper? Yes, I remember my daddy telling me about you, the illegitimate boy elected twice governor of Tennessee. Old Governor Hooper looked up at Fred with tears in his eyes. He said, I was born that day at that church. He had been living the birth pangs, but that day he was born anew. See, we Christians believe that when life is at its darkest, God is still there beyond all our earthly anxieties and that we're just living through the birth pangs of an age yet to come. And yes, this age may be coming to an end, but there is another age coming, about to be born, God's age. And things will be so radically different from our present age, we'll know beyond a doubt that when we're in it, we'll know this is it. This is it. It's God's world now. It can happen individually, it can happen as a congregation, it can happen as a society. But no, ma no matter how dark we may be living right now, that's just the birth pangs of what is about to be born as God's world. Amen.